Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Week 8, Legislative Institutions. You should have already viewed Week 8, Lecture 1A, Week 8, Lecture 1B, which is a survey of the role of legislative institutions with an emphasis upon the U.S. Congress, which you should have already studied in Political Science 1101. But it's more of a review to help you, and it will make the international context uh, make more sense and be uh, uh, more uh, able to assimilate that information after viewing those first two essays. Okay, so now we turn to the main lecture. You should have already read the lecture notes, which are very helpful in uh, introducing you to legislative institutions in a comparative context, as well as the textbook, which is the authoritative textbook. Uh, in America today. Okay, what is a legislature? When you think of legislatures in terms of democracies, where power is shared, but sometimes you have what is called a legislature in authoritarian or totalitarian governments, even though they may not have a lot of power. So that's what we're going to talk about. Legislatures are the most important institution in theory in democratic political systems because they are the most representative. They are multi-member institutions. They're made up usually of a relatively large number of, of uh, individuals who are typically elected to office. Each one has a similar amount of power, but when they move into the leadership of those institutions, they may in fact have more power. Um, and legislatures are known by their power to control budgetary items, uh, national security issues, and ultimately to be the uh, uh, representation of the people in all those great debates that a country will have. Also, we know how they make decisions because they vote. A legislature is known by voting. Um, the legislatures in non-democratic political systems uh, are... Uh, different than in democratic systems. And we'll spend our time mainly with democratic systems, but typically a um, legislature in a authoritarian or totalitarian system is a honorific position, that you're an active member of the political party, therefore you're given this position and you come and uh, you have a nice dinner of um, uh, caviar and, and filet mignon and uh, some nice uh, beverages and you get to vote and you get to dress up, but really it's the, the centralization of power uh, means that you don't have a lot of uh, authority. But we're going to spend our time looking mainly at democratic institutions. Let's turn to the structure of these legislative institutions. They call them by different names. In the United States, we call it the U.S. Congress, House of Representatives, uh, United States Senate. Typically, a legislative body has two chambers. We call that bicameralism. That means that the two bodies must agree. The two bodies also tend to be somewhat different in composition, and they sometimes vary in the amount of power that they have. Um, also, there are, are comparative legislative institutions where there's only one body. In the United States, for example, we have a state legislature, a state legislative body. In Nebraska, they only have one body. Um, some of the provinces in Canada, our neighbor to the north, only have one body. And then in the Western European country, uh, NATO member, uh, ally of the United States, Portugal, they only have one legislative body. It's a smaller country, uh, and that makes the necessity of two bodies uh, less powerful. Okay, let's talk about bicameralism. Bicameralism is two bodies. Uh, usually there's a, a lower house and an upper house. And we've talked about this to some degree already in lectures uh, 1A and 1B. In a parliamentary system, which is different from uh, the United States system that we call a presidential system, uh, in a parliamentary system, the members are elected differently, but uh, they also serve or are from a geographic era, area. And we'll be talking more about that later as well. Okay, bicameralism, upper house, and then a lower house. Um, the lower house is usually has the largest number of members because they serve a smaller area. The upper house, on the other hand, usually has fewer members. And they also serve an area, but
but the area tends to be larger, okay? So, and they, how they come to that office may be somewhat different over time. Okay, uh, so in the, in the United States, the lower house would be the United, the United States House of Representatives, 435 members, and they're elected for a shorter period of time, a two-year term, uh, versus the U.S. Senate, the upper house, which would be a six-year term. And the U.S. the U.S. House, 435 members are elected from uh, much smaller geographical areas than uh, the U.S. Senate, which is part of the Constitutional Compromise of 1787. Uh, that the Senate would be two per state. So Montana and California have the same number of senators, but where Montana has one member of the House, California has 55. It's based on population, the Senate a quota, two per state. We'll talk about how that relates to an international context as well. Okay, let's talk about the upper house in a comparative sense. Uh, usually the upper house, as we mentioned earlier, differs greatly in the number of members on one hand, their period of office on the other hand, and also the amount of political power that they have. In the United States, with the United States Senate, two per state, 100 U.S. Senators, they have tremendous power, much more power than a member of the House. They have powers that the House does not have. For example, in the United States, you can, uh, the President can nominate someone for office, whether it's the Supreme Court or a Cabinet office, but that, uh, that person must be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. The House plays no role in the confirming of executive officers or judges. In the United Kingdom, the House of Lords is much less politically important than the House of Commons, their lower house. You basically inherit your seat in the House of Lords. Uh, although since the 1950, 1950s, that has begun to change. In France, for example, uh, their upper house has 321 members, all serve a nine-year term, and um, and so it's it's a much larger house. In the German upper house, the Bundestag, uh, they directly represent the individual states that make up uh, contemporary Germany. Um, each Bundestag. Uh, member is from a particular state. Okay, so while we're thinking about that, uh, that is part of bicameralism. Let's talk about different uh, types of bicameralism. One of them is what they call asymmetrical uh, bicameralism. That's where one of the other of the houses have more power than the other. Uh, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, the House of Lords being essentially honorific and not as engaged as the House of Commons, even though the House of Commons is the lower house, the House of Commons is by far the most important body. It's where most of the important decisions are made, and it is the most important body in British politics. Um, the other type of bicameralism is what we call symmetrical bicameralism, symmetrical bicameralism. That means that the houses are basically equal, that they both have to agree on everything for any piece of legislation to be uh, successful. For example, in the United States, um, if the president wants to create a new uh, submarine system uh, and, and members that he has people that are friendly to him in the House of Representatives present it, he must also have the same bill in the U.S. Senate. So the House and Senate must agree for any bill uh, to be passed. So that's what we call symmetrical bicameralism. Uh, they, they have equal power, although the House has power when it comes to the budget, according to Article One of the Constitution. The Senate has the power, on the other hand, of approving treaties and also approving president executive appointments like judges and cabinet officers. So it is a symmetrical uh, bicameralism in that they both have both have to pass all bills, but they each have their own little uh, special powers over the other. Um, um, most democracies have one or two of these types of bicameralism. Um, okay, let's talk about size and comparative politics. They vary tremendously uh, among countries, as you might imagine. Countries vary in size, population, uh, political complexity. Um, U.S. House has 435 members. U.S. Senate has 100. But um, the uh, U.S. House... Uh, 400, uh, 435 members are representing basically over uh, 300 million people. 
Uh, that's a lot. And in 1929, uh, a law was passed that we don't increase the size. The U.S., the, the British House of Commons, on the other hand, has 659 members for 56 million people. So you can see the British member of their uh, lower house, the House of Commons, uh, has a much smaller uh, number of constituents or people they serve as compared to a U.S. House member. Uh, almost seven times as many in the U.S. House. Most legislatures also have a staff component. And I speak from experience having served on a, the staff of a U.S. Uh, House member uh, many years ago, long before you guys were born. Uh, but uh, the, the staff is what uh, Michael Malbin, the great student of congressional politics, called uh, the backbone of Congress. Most of the work is done in the staffs. Uh, this has increased in the professionalization of legislatures, um, and uh, which leads us to another uh, uh, closely related topic is the idea of political leadership. Leadership varies tremendously, and I would urge you to read closely the textbook chapter uh, and uh, my lecture notes to give you some idea of how this changes. It varies in the legislature, the country, uh, also the, the, the nature of how each legislative body in a country carries out its work uh, and, and, and what are the, the limitations and the advantages of that. Um, we also talk in the lecture notes about the role of political parties in the legislature. And basically by that, uh, we mean uh, how loyal. In the United States, uh, they tend to be um, uh, less loyal than in England or France or Germany. Uh, and uh, the only time typically in the United States that you have a pure party line vote. And by that, I mean where everyone in the political party votes for their candidate is when they're electing the leadership uh, of that particular body. Uh, for example, electing the, electing the uh, constitutionally required speaker of the U.S. House. Um, in the lecture notes, there's a very thorough description of the different kind of committee structures, the different roles. Also, there's a discussion of what, how to think about the representative. Uh, our idea in the United States is very different from what it is in a comparative politics um, and what the role of the representative is. So we talked about the, a number of models. One is a Burkean role where the representative serves as sort of a uh, delegate, a trustee. Uh, we also talked about really the difference between the trustee model and the delegate model in the notes, I urge you to look at that very closely, as well as in the textbook. And that gives you some idea of where we're headed and how this, uh, how legislatures function uh, in a comparative sense. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a, that's a quick overview uh, lecture. Uh, follow us the other two uh, sort of uh, background lectures. Uh, again, read the, the, the notes uh, for the course very carefully, as well as the textbook and you will have a solid uh, preparation and, and background knowledge for understanding comparative legislative institutions. Thank you very much.